मैडम ने डाला Isha, you can proceed. So here we go live. Uh, good evening, everyone, to all the delegates, faculties, and the audience who have joined us today. So I welcome you all to the Core Connect Apollo OBGY Society live webinar with us. So we have Rupali Rathe, Madam. Thank you, ma'am, for giving the opportunity to be connected with you with the Society Apollo Ops and Gynec Society. So to take the proceeding forward, I invite you, ma'am. uh yeah am i audible yes ma'am you are very yeah. much uh, thank you so much uh, uh, i welcome all my seniors my colleagues my fellow doctors who have logged in for today's webinar i welcome you all and this is our first virtual webinar in our uh, uh, webinar series it gives me immense pleasure and satisfaction while fulfilling your wish of having topic of adolescence pcos and related related issues a topic which was mentioned by a large number in our feedback feedback form i hope with today's session you will have many of your doubts and yeah, completely cleared uh, let us start a cme with a virtual lamp lighting and seek blessings of almighty for successful cmes in the coming year uh, nisha can we have our uh, secretary dr prerna to take over hello hello welcome good evening respected speakers seniors and my dear friends welcome to our academic virtual event i'm super excited to have you all uh, excited about all the amazing conversations that we will have today and learning about many new things in this last two years due to covid 19 we have now become accustomed to webinars so on behalf of akola obgy society once again i welcome you all for this interesting session our guest of honor today is dr girish mane sir sir is so good to have you here thank you so much for joining us uh, i promise you that this webinar is going to be inadvertently educational and inspiring as we have three eminent speakers with us today today we are going to discuss about very interesting and common problems of gynecology which we come across in our day to day practice gynecological problems starts from adolescent age group itself uh, if we catch it up early we can prevent many problems in reproductive age group most common adolescent problem is polycystic ovarian disease which manifests in many different ways like oligomenorrhea uh, hirsutism central obesity polymenorrhea acne infertility etc so to enhance our knowledge about adolescent pcod we have dr sujatha kar ma'am with us today welcome ma'am we appreciate you ma'am for making time from your busy schedule to guide us uh, and for pcod related infertility we have dr pesi louis sir with us i think sir needs no introduction naam hi kaafi hai unless you are new to the gynec world and not to miss most important management criteria for pcod which is diet and lifestyle modification for that we have ruti sound ma'am with us today she is the authority for diet in pcod so here i welcome our guest of honor and our three eloquent speakers for webinar today now i request our president 
Dr. Rupali Rathi, ma'am, to introduce our guest of honor. It gives me immense pleasure to have Dr. Girish Mane, sir, as our guest of honor, a name who needs no introduction. Sir, I sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation and for taking out time from your busy schedule. I sincerely appreciate that, sir. Dr. Girish Mane, sir, is past president of Yavatmal Ubijoy Society. He is past chairperson from, of Adolescent Gynecologic Committee amongst 2018-20. He was awarded Best Chairperson amongst 2018-20. He is also the recipient of Foxy Smriti Mal Malayan Save Baby Girl Runner-Up Award. He is recipient of Best Society Award amongst. He is also recipient of Dr. Durusha Youth Trophy and Dr. Sadhna Desai Award in 2017. He is first winner of Foxy Talent Singing Con Contest. He, con he has contributed five chapters in Foxy Focus. He has presented many papers in national and state conferences. Editor of Foxy Focus Adolescent Intervention, sir. Very, very. We are very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, I request Dr. Girish Mane, sir, to say a few words. Thank you very much for kind words, ma'am. And once again, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this amazing program. And I'm really very happy that you have chosen my subject. I'm in the subject which is very close to my heart, that is the adolescent and the adolescent health issues. As your first academic, uh, I mean, program. Really, thank you very much, and I, I extend my congratulations to you and your secretary, Dr. Prerna, and I, I extend my best wishes for the coming tenure, and I'm there always with all you guys. Uh, once again, I welcome all of you. A very good evening uh, to today's speaker, Dr. Sujata Kar, Madam, Dr. Faisi Lewis, who is not only a good speaker, but he is vice president of my committee, and Dr. Uh, Ruby Sound. Uh, I'm really, uh, I mean, uh, waiting for uh, to listen uh, all of you. Friends, as you all know that India is having, uh, I think, the highest uh, number of adolescents in any, uh, I mean, in, as compared to any other country. Almost one thirty, one third of the population, that is more than 36 billion of the Indians, they belong to this category. Once upon a time, I remember when we were kids, actually the doctor and the parents, they were not bothering about the adolescent and their adolescent health issues. But nowadays, because of the sedentary lifestyle or there are so many other factors, this obesity, then psychosocial problem, then family problem. There are many problems they are getting. Uh, they are, I mean, rising in the adolescent health population day by day. And that's why now there is a need of special adolescent clinic also, which was which was never thought uh, 10, 10 years ago. And as you all know that obesity, that is the main cause for many, many diseases, I think. And nowadays, uh, I mean, the, there are so many menstrual issues with the girls and because of the obesity, they are facing the problems like PCO, then the complications of the PCOS, not only uh, in today's, I mean, the current age, but they are facing this problem in their future also. And that's why the most of the obstetricians, they are very keen to work on the issues where we can prevent the uh, future, I mean, the infertility in, uh, or the future fertility of these adolescent uh, girls. And these are not only the issues with the girls, but these are the issues uh, with the boys also. I, I, I do remember that in our school when we were students, we used to see hardly very few, I mean, boys and the girls who were obese, but now a days we have to find out the boys and the girls who are not obese. And that is really a very poor sin and very disaster. It is, it is going to be very disaster condition in the future also. Actually, we are not, I mean, uh, we are not aware what, what can be the, uh, I mean, health scenario in the adolescent community in the coming future. Not only these issues, but there are other, another issues like drugs, drug abuse or the substance abuse, then psychosocial, uh, psychosocial disturbances, then family disturbances, then uh, getting involvement, early involvement in the sexual activities. And that's why facing the uh, other health issues like STDs, then MTPs, teenage pregnancies, and so and so. So I'm very happy, ma'am, that you have chosen a very good topic for today's uh, this academic bonanza. And I'm looking forward to hear Dr. Kerr, Dr. Uh, Faisi Lewis, and Dr. Ruby, and the, the very interesting subject that is adolescent PCOS. Actually, there are some myths also regarding the adolescent PCOS. And that's why many times, only because of uh, that sonographic uh, sonological report, many patients, they are overtreated as having adolescent PCOS. And that's why there is really a need uh, to discuss this subject amongst all the obstetricians. So uh, I extend my uh, best wishes to Rupali Madam and uh, Dr. Prerna for their tenure. And I al uh, also, I wish everyone happy learning and over to you, uh, MOC. And thank you very much once again for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Girish Mane, sir. Uh, 
Thank you, sir, for your kind words. And what you described about present scenario of obesity, STD in adolescents is absolutely true. Now, moving ahead to our speaker, uh, I would request uh, Rupali Rathi, ma'am, to introduce our first speaker. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Prerna. I am honored to have Dr. Sujata Kar, ma'am, and she is our guest speaker for first talk, <laughs> Adolescent PCO Management and Counseling, which I really think, as sir rightly said, Mani sir, that... Uh, it is very uh, less discussed and less uh, treated condition according to me, especially adolescent girls. And it's really the need of time. So, madam, uh, no one can speak much better than you because I've heard you, madam, many times. So, I really wanted you for this topic and I'm happy that you accepted my invitation. Uh, madam is practicing gynecologist, gynecologic uh, endoscopist uh, and she's also practicing ART for last 25 years. She has areas of her areas of interest are polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, male infertility, and scope of st stem cells in gynecology. Her major achievements include best graduate and seven gold medals in MBBS MD, credited with first IVF baby of Eastern Orissa, first TISA for frozen embryo and laser hash babies of Orissa. She also have, she also has received Pariche Award for Women Achiever Orissa 2019. Devi Awards from Di for Dynamism and Innovation from Chief Minister. She was Brand Icons. She also has received Brand Icons Excellence Award in 2018 for Best IVF Center. Also, her, she has a lot of publications to her credit. She has 15 original publications related to PCOS and male infertility, male fertility in PubMed. Written many chapters for books and newslet newsletters. Reviewer of many international journals, and she is on. Honorable Treasurer of ISAR India. She is also EC member of IGE, ISSRF, PCOS Societies by FPS of India. So very happy to have you, Madam. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rupali, Dr. Predna, for having me here. And uh, most importantly, for having me for a topic which is my favorite. I love to uh, speak on PCOS. Um, that uh, CV uh, that which I sent you was an old CV. So that is showing me as the treasurer. Uh, I must correct it. Um, currently, I am the Secretary General of ISAR. And it gives me real pleasure to be with the Akola Society today. Um, so my topic is adolescent uh, PCOS. And like uh, Dr. Rani spoke so eloquently and so worriedly, about the fact that we all agree that we are facing an epidemic of PCOS as well as obesity and as well as metabolic syndrome. And the worst part is as with the number of scientific papers that are getting published on PCOS, still it is something of which we, it is still an enigma and we don't understand it much. So incidence and uh, diagnosis both are improving. There is no doubt about it. Uh, so the incidence is rising, the diagnosis is also uh, improving. And if we use strict criteria, I'm not sure uh, Dr. Rane quoted about 36%. Uh, but yes, there was one study in um, of uh, uh, urban um, girls of some school or college from uh, Mumbai, which showed almost a 35, 50%, uh, 35 to 40% uh, prevalence of PCOS. But if we use strict criteria, uh, like uh, NIH, the incidence would be about 10%. And uh, with Rotterdam criteria, which we all know overdiagnosis PCOS, it may be about uh, 25%. But the more worrying part is that many studies have reported a two to three year delay in the diagnosis of PCOS, which many girls uh, face apart from being overdiagnosed. Now, making the correct diagnosis is very important. And to do it at the correct time is even more important. That is how adolescents uh, come in, in uh, the picture. Because we know that this is a long-term uh, issue and there are so many things in the long-term that the girl needs to understand, the family needs to understand. And uh, we can't brand somebody as PCOS and give her a lifelong metabolic disease uh, without being absolutely sure. Etiology, of course, is uh, complicated and I'm not going to bore you by all the various uh, theories of etiology. That is not what we are, we are going to discuss mostly practical things today. But genetics and environment. These two are the main stays of the uh, etiology. So genetics along with our lifestyle at this time is what is causing or increasing uh, PCOS, resulting in hormonal changes, obesity, 
which results in insulin increase, increased androgen, and the combination of hyperinsulinemia, hyperandrogenemia, all combined together and through a vicious circle uh, result in all the various uh, clinical uh, features and the different phenotypes of PCOS. Contributing factors are many. Uh, we know the current lifestyle, it, in, it, whatever it involves, it's a big problem. Whatever I'm going to talk today and whatever I'm going to quote today is from this um, excellent uh, recent uh, publication, um, which is our go-to document if we want to discuss or uh, quote anything about the management and diagnosis of PCOS. It is the New International Evidence-Based Guidelines published in 2018. So I'm going to quote uh, and I'm going to um, uh, cite this uh, article, this um, article that has been published. So the first thing is diagnosis. Diagnosis can be difficult, mostly because the two main symptoms of PCOS, which is menstrual irregularity and evidence of hyperandrogenemia are common with that of normal puberty. So how do we decide who is to be uh, investigated for PCOS? Which girl in our adolescent, in the adolescence needs to be investigated? So uh, basically, Somebody who has extremely irregular menses, we will define that in our coming slides, who has very abnormal weight gain during adolescence, somebody who has severe and persistent acne, and the hirsutism is extremely significant or increases uh, rapidly, or at least is, not, is more than uh, women in her family, like her sister, her mother. Otherwise, also sufficiently anxious teenager, because these days, social media news, uh, everybody is aware. They just come to you and say, Madam, do I have PCOS? Do I have PCOD? That one is that one. My friend is having PCOD. Do I have PCOD? So anybody who's sufficiently anxious also, it is not wrong for us to uh, uh, decide to investigate them. So first thing is how to define irregular menses. We know that in the first year after menarche, everything is normal. Almost all kinds of irregularities, you must reassure them that they are, they are normal. But other than that, up to three years from anarchy, any menses which is more than 45 days or less than 25 days after three years of menarche can be considered abnormal. And after, uh, after three years from menarche, less than 21 and more than 35 days. If there is an amenorrhea of more than 90 days at any time post menarche, that is also abnormal. If there is primary amenorrhea, by the age of 15 years, apart from so many other causes can be there, but PCOS also can be one of the causes. So she needs to be investigated. And anyone, any girl after three years of thalarchy, breast development, if she is amenorrhea. So they are not absolutely a reason for PCOS, but they need to be investigated. Uh, we know that. So this is how you define irregular menses. Now, hyperandrogenemia, the features are, number one is acne. Acne also persistent and severe acne. So we always ask question about whether it disappears after the menses, whether there is acne in the back, whether there is acne in the upper uh, arms, and whether there is inflammation and whether there is marks, I mean, scarring, etc. So the severity and persistence of the acne and abnormal positions of the acne like back and um, upper arms will indicate to you that this is probably something more than the normal puberty uh, related um, acne, which almost everybody faces. Hirsutism, we have a, a FG score system. We know the modified FG score more than six, more than eight is to be considered abnormal. Uh, and uh, of course, the various sites are there. Uh, the type of hair, the, uh, the thickness, the color, um, all these things have to be taken into account. And we also have to understand that these days, epilation is so common, so common uh, that uh, one should give a gap of about... Uh, six weeks or three months since last epilation before you make a uh, estimation of clinical uh, hirsutism. And then male pattern baldness also has different types that also needs to be assessed. Then assessment of metabolic syndrome. PCOS always should be assessed in the view of clinical symptoms of PCOS as well as that of metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, BMI, base circumference, abnormal waist hip ratio, the reference points are there. I'm not going to go there. The neck circumference, increase in neck circumference. Acanthosis uh, nigricans, a very uh, good surrogate of uh, insulin resistance and skin tags. 
these are some of the features of metabolic uh, syndrome. So a young girl who is demonstrating all these, uh, then she also uh, should be considered as a possibility of metabolic syndrome and investigated further. So once you have decided on the girl who has come to, uh, in, uh, come to consult you, that, okay, this girl needs to be investigated. Her symptoms are severe enough. Then we have to decide what investigation we should do. So the possibility is pelvic scan, question mark. What blood test to do? Then if blood test, then which ones for hyperandrogenemia, which ones for metabolic syndrome, etc. Now, pelvic ultrasound. The first thing I want to emphasize today is that ultrasound is not important. It is not needed for the diagnosis of PCOS in adolescence. In fact, after the new international guidelines, we know that the importance of ultrasound has really been taken away and it probably does, is not needed at all. If at all you do, because in young girls, we, you can, adolescents, you will mostly do only abdominal, a high resolution scan with at least a more than 8 megahertz uh, probe and depend only on the volume of the ovary being more than 10. Don't bother with the number of uh, follicles uh, per ovary. So um, the importance of ultrasound is down. It is not. Required. Now, should you test for biochemical hyperandrogen? That again is a big question mark because this is much better to rely on clinical features than to rely on bio, uh, biochemical uh, features. Because why? Because the limits of biological hyperandrogenemia is not understood. We do not know what is our cutoff, what is our population-based cutoff, what is her um, genetic uh, genetics. Uh, why, what is the chances that because so many girls have uh, even in our country we know there is so much variation in hirsutism and higher features of hyperandrogenemia in the, between the different uh, parts of the country so a uh, significant ethnic racial differences are there and population based cutoffs of testosterone levels are not known so it is very difficult to decide on what is biochemical hyperandrogenemia so when you should do a biochemical uh, test for hyperandrogenemia only when the girl has features of hyperandrogenemia, uh, like uh, severe oligo um, amenorrhea, etc., uh, and other features, but does not have clinical hyperandrogenemia. You do not see uh, severe hirsutism, you do not see too much acne, and other features. In that case, to make a diagnosis of PCOS, you might do a um, biochemical test, or if the severity is so much and the onset is sudden. And the increase in androgenization is so much that you are expecting and you need to rule out other causes of um, uh, hyperandrogenic. In that case, you might do biochemical tests. So if you decide to do what test to do, there's a whole gamut of tests. There are people, there are labs which offer PCOS spectrum. So frankly, you do not need to do those tests at all. If at all you need to exclude, you might do total testosterone. Again, a, a big question mark, but I'll come to that. Uh, you can, you should do 17 hydroxyprogesterone because you need to exclude uh, congenital adrenal uh, hypoplasia. And then, if these are positive, you might do other tests for Cushing's and adrenal uh, tumors and you know, uh, you know, other other symptoms of severe hyperinsulinemia and hyperandrogenemia. Uh, so basically, even if we go by what the new guidelines tell us, what we have to understand is biochemical hyperandrogenemia is very difficult to test. The tests are not accurate. If at all we use, we should be using a high quality assays. And free testosterone, although is the best test, you might use a surrogate of total testosterone where you have a, a well-defined um, laboratory uh, with a, regularly, a lab which does regular tests and you can depend on the uh, cut off that the lab uh, suggests to you. So biochemical hyperandrogenemia is difficult to define. Next, should you test adolescent girls for metabolic disorders? Even if she has features or no features of metabolic syndrome, you should test for metabolic um, uh, metabolic abnormalities also, like uh, glucose intolerance and dyslipidemias. Even if the girl is thin, I would say we must test because we have published in our uh, range of population almost 25% of uh, women who were lean still had abnormal uh, lipids and abnormal uh, glucose intolerance. Lean PCOS also had. So certainly we should be testing, and this is the um, guideline uh, pediatric ATP3 that tells us uh, that we should be testing all adolescent girls with features of PCOS 
for metabolic abnormalities and the metabolic abnormalities you should look for hypertension dyslipidemia glucose intolerance and if the girl has family history then we certainly should be testing so in my practice whenever i see a girl and i decide she needs to be investigated i do a ultrasound but i do a ultrasound only to check for ovarian volume and to see if there are any other abnormalities sometimes they're bleeding for a long time you want to look at the endometrium and things like that but the test that i normally do is only these five which is the thyroid function test prolactin a total testosterone many people will not agree with me but i do it for because i do a lot of publications research publications so we have a cut off for total testosterone i and i do that lipid profile and the 75 gram uh, glucose uh, for this these are the tests that i uh, do uh, guidelines for the diagnosis again we have to now depend on the new international guidelines currently uh, when the rotterdam was there we were using only uh, the uh, adult criteria for adults which is not correct if you go by the recent uh, uh, criteria what we have to see this is the step wise way we should go to exclude pcos in a young girl any girl who comes to you with irregular cycles and clinical hyperandrogenism uh, severe acne uh, hirsutism um, baldness Uh, other things like acanthosis and all those things, then you have to exclude other causes. If other causes are not there, she you can make a diagnosis of PCOS at whatever age. If she has no clinical hyperandrogenism but only severely irregular cycle, then you might have to do biochemical tests. And then I would generally depend only on a total testosterone. If it is possible, you could do a free testosterone using all those high uh quality assays that has been uh, mentioned chemiluminescence and radio immuno assays uh, etc and then if that is positive you make a diagnosis of pcos if there is only irregular cycle and no hyperandrogenemia clinical or biochemical then you might do a scan in an adult but not in an adolescent again you may not bother but you may do in an adol adolescent you get you if you ultrasound whether positive or negative doesn't matter if you cannot make a clear cut diagnosis of pcos you have to put them as at risk of pcos and then plan and give them long term uh, advice <coughs> so i think i have finished almost uh, 15 minutes i'll take another 5 uh, minutes to discuss a little bit about the uh, treatment the treatment for adolescent pcos has so many aspects that it is not easy to uh discuss it in one uh lecture and that too in a couple of minutes so at least we should define long term goals in the young girl whom we have made a diagnosis of pcos certainly she wants regular uh, menses how to reduce signs of hyperandrogenemia how to manage weight how to improve her fertility because today she is 19 20 she is going to need her fertility uh, sometime or the other but <coughs> then decrease the risk of uh, metabolic uh metabolic syndrome glucose intolerance look at self esteem uh, you know body image issues sleep disorders psych psychosocial <coughs> increase uh, interactions and decrease the long term risk of endometriosis these are our aims and we have to work towards that lifestyle a big issue uh it we have to try our best to make it as smart as possible which means specific measurable achievable realistic and timely we cannot let a lifestyle be only about weight so we have to discuss emotional well being quality of life depression anxiety psychosexual problems body image these girls many of them have sleep issues of course uh, sleep apnea and all is for most severe cases sleep issues many of them have many of them have eating disorders and many of them of course will have uh, like uh, other issues so lifestyle at least when i talk to them i talk to them about five things exercise diet sleep substance abuse work and study hours cut down on sugars carbohydrates exercise what is the minimum defined exercise don't look at a goal Ex define exercise on a daily basis and try to be consistent consistent even if it is for 5 minutes at least do every 5 minutes every day 5 minutes for 365 days that is what you can uh, you we have to try and do behavioral changes is the most important thing 
and one has to understand that there are many women who have psychological causes why they might be having eating disorders apart from the fact that they have uh, weight issues which are probably genetic there was a time when i used to you know how i used to talk to uh, i used to discuss with uh, the girls i used to say weight loss is like mathematics weight loss is like mathematics which means that uh, whatever you take in and whatever you take out uh, um, and use as energy and you should be able to maintain your weight but now we know that probably girls and uh, women with pcos have abnormality epigenetic abnormalities induced in their fat cells or stem cell, uh, fat stem cells which can result in a much more difficulty in losing weight and uh, uh, you know intrinsic problems which might be uh, 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 the reason why they are not able to lose weight and of course how the society and the world is changing we cannot uh, do that uh, pharmacological treatment options again uh, is many um, uh, as of now this is the 2017 pediatric multinational a report which tells us that as of now there is no treatment no pharmacological treatment which has been approved for adolescents with pcos so what do we do we know that after lifestyle metformin and or oral contraceptive pills these are the mainstay metformin probably for overweight obese uh, girls is a good choice uh, we do not have long term studies the studies that have been published is for one year maximum probably about uh, 12 uh, 12 months or 2 years or so uh, probably the last study that i saw for metformin follow up for adolescents was about for about one year i don't know if there now more longer duration studies but um, yes met- metformin is one of the main stays it can it should be discussed in uh, obese it has a greater role but it also has a role in um, uh, 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 leaner girls if necessary and after looking at your patient profile it has to be individualized oral contraceptive pills are the mainstay you have to give them but main again a lot of question comes as to how long you will give which is the formulation you can give so the new international guidelines tell us that uh, so this was um, i'm sorry i'm rushing because that is not in context with today's talk so uh, this was a rct that we had published uh, metformin and oral contraceptive versus oral contraceptive pills for uh, young adolescent girls in our uh, population uh, and we showed that uh, metformin uh, was good for um, you know obese women and it was good to for abnormal bmi weight hip ratio waist circumference but oc pill was much better for improving metabolic uh, parameters so key takeaways from today's talk where the uh, pharmacology and uh, things are concerned one of the main questions which patients ask uh, young girls how long can we take oral contraceptive pill again oral contraceptive pill prescription will be based on what are the patient symptoms some girls are having um, amenorrhea and then prolonged bleeding some girls are having amenorrhea and then very scanty bleeding some girls are having um, amenorrhea for 6 months 7 months so based on individual patient's profile we have to decide uh, how to do how much to treat but best is probably to counsel the patient party that she needs regular follow up and regular check up i usually call them after every 6 months or every one year and look at how much lifestyle changes they have been able to make and based on that decide on um, uh, whether to continue the medication and uh, how long to continue uh, and whether to stop or to change Uh, metformin whether to stop uh, or to continue inositols i i uh, as i have shown you inositols are a uh, big are there in a big way in the market they have a lot of pharma push but unfortunately till now although it's a very promising drug uh, the side effects are much less uh, the cost is more and the evidence is not there as much as it is there for metformin oral contraceptive pills also the evidence for different formulations is not there the new guidelines also tell us that any um, uh, uh, low dose oral contraceptive pill is good enough we do not have to prescribe them the high dose ones the high do- uh, sorry the uh, newer um, uh, ones with the anti androgens uh, etc which are much more costly they are not necessary they will not re- necessarily reduce the androgen levels uh, at a different level compared to the uh, cheaper uh, low dose uh, pills 
So one has to individualize. If I have to give a, a, a some takeaways as I finish my lecture, um, com combined contraceptive pills are definitely most useful for menstrual irregularities as well as for uh, hyperandrogenemia. There is no recommendation for any specific formulation or dose. It is just like for uh, general population. But however, the new guidelines have mentioned the cyproterone acetate combination should not be the first line. Only if there is severe hyperandrogenemia and the patient does not respond to other uh, oral contraceptive pills, only in that case you might consider a cyprotron acetate uh, pill because we know that cyprotron acetate is not marketed in many countries. At least it's not approved by for marketing by the US FDA. Uh, PCOS specific risk factors like BMI, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemia, hypertension has to be considered. We see so many young girls who have all these risk factors including family history of um, uh, coagulatory, uh, coagulatory uh, dis dysfunction. So in those, we have to be very careful about prescribing uh, the oral contraceptive pill and we'll have to find some other way uh, to manage her uh, menses. Uh, COC and metformin is, the combination is best you know, for an obese girl along with the uh, lifestyle and for metabolic syndrome. Uh, abnormal uh, glucose tolerance test and high FP groups. In all these, the combination is the best. In our category of patient also, metformin, an excellent drug for uh, adolescent PCOS. Antiandrogens like cyprotron acetate may be added. We can certainly add. If it is more severe, we can send to an endocrinologist. Take an opinion of the endocrinologist uh, also. But prescribing an antiandrogen uh, can be given if the COC and the cosmetic therapy fails or if the girl is very severely hyperandrogenic and antiandrogen may also be added for alopecia because alopecia indicates severe uh, hyperandrogenia and that can be uh, added for that. So thank you very much. This was uh, kind of uh, rushed the treatment but the treatment options for PCOS are so vast uh, that one has to take up each uh, separately and uh, you know discuss that and discuss the current evidence. Only then we will be able to do justice to it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, our beautiful speaker, Dr. Sujata Karmam, for expanding and highlighting our knowledge on adolescent PCOD. Some of the take-home messages uh, from her talk are early and correct diagnosis is very important. Genetics and lifestyle changes are important cause for PCOD. Whom we need to investigate for PCOD? There were patients with very irregular menses, uh, very abnormal weight gain, severe and persistent acne, significant hirsutism or increasing rapidly and a family history of PCOD. Uh, up to three uh, and patients with irregular menses, if uh, she is having up to three years irregular menses, that is less than 21 days or more than 45 days. And what investigations to be done? Pelvic scan is not that much important or not needed in PCOD in adolescent, uh, unless she is having other problems like hyperandrogenemia. And uh, uh, all girls with PCOD to be tested for uh, metabolic uh, abnormalities and even one with the family history. Uh, uh, about the treatment management, first most important thing is lifestyle management. In this, we should consider not only weight, but also psychosexual issues, sleep, consistent exercise, substance abuse, and study hours. And uh, treatment, no pharmacological treatment up till now uh, is sure for PCOD, but still we can give metformin for PC, uh, obese PCOD as well as lean PCOD patients. And uh, according to two, uh, new international guidelines, we can give OC pills if patients is having uh, metabolic disorders and mainly low dose OC pills. Uh, and anti-androgens may also be added. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I welcome uh, Dr. Rupali Rati, ma'am, to uh, uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Prerna. Our next speaker is Dr. Fessy Lewis. Sir, your achievements and qualifications are known to everyone that are present in this session. And it's a matter of immense pride that a person of stature is going to talk as a speaker for us now. I'm, I'm really thankful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation uh, for this talk. Uh, Dr. Fessy Lewis, Nisha, can you show the CV? Uh, Dr. Fessy Lewis is... Uh, Senior Consultant and Associate Professor in the in charge of MCH course. He is in the Department of Reproductive Medicine and Surgery, uh, Institute of Medical Sciences, Cochin, Kerala. 
Sir is Foxy Vice President 2021. He is, SR, he is also executive member of ISR National. Uh, ICOG con Governing Council member for 2021-22. Vice Chairperson Kerala Chapter IAG. Secretary Kerala Chapter of ISR. Executive member Kerala Chapter. He also uh, was a committee chairperson of All India Foxy International Academic Exchange. Uh, he was also Secretary General of All India Kerala, Kerala Federation of Obstetric and Gynecology, a member of FIGO Reproductive Medicine Core Committee, and uh, he was Vice President of KFOG 2019, Editor of KFOG Journal and Website 2009 and 11, 9 to 11. He received Oxy Corion Kamini Rao U Operator Imaging Science Awards, Praveen Mehta Fellowship in Endoscopy, and also, he has uh, received Kumud Tamaskar Research Prize in Infertility. Sir, uh, oh. over to you, sir. We are very uh, thankful to you, sir, again. Uh, uh, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Is the sound audible? Very yes, much. sir. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, for uh, uh, Dr. Ubali, for the introduction. I'll start sharing this slide. Okay, is it uh, uh, seen? Hello? Yes, sir, sir. Make it uh, on uh, this. Yes, sir. Slideshow mode, sir. Make it on slideshow mode. Uh, I think I made it in slideshow mode. Is it slideshow mode? No, sir. It is not slideshow mode right yet. Now, is it sl slideshow? No. Uh -oh. Let's uh, share again. Sir, you must have opened two different I mean, presentations, the same presentation twice on your desktop. So just close both the both the presentations and start again. You share it again, sir. Once. Is it seen now? Yes, yes. You have to do it on slideshow. No, no, mine it is seen as slideshow. Is it slideshow? No, no, sir. You can once you can close all the tabs, sir. Again, we open the presentation and share. I'm opening it again because uh, my laptop, there is some problem, that's why. Okay, is it? Seen slideshow now? No, sir. What is it? Is my slide seen? Yes, yes. So you can mail me your. It was uh, full screen now, just now. Okay. Is it, is it seen now? No. no sir. So you Pethi can sir, mail me your presentation. Pethi sir, open this presentation on a slideshow mode. I mean, full screen mode uh, on your lap, laptop and then uh, select it. Okay. It's PC. There is some uh, problem with the uh, audio of my uh, laptop. Laptop, that's why. So you can, you can open this uh, presentation in a slideshow format and then choose it.
Uh, or, or if the next speaker is there, I will ch change my laptop and uh, uh, do it. Is the next speaker ready? Drupali, ma'am. You're mute, ma'am. Uh, yeah, we can uh, we can take the next next lecture if you want, sir. Okay, okay. I will I will come back. I will come. Ruby, ma'am, here. Huh? I'm I'm ready with the slides, ma'am. If you want, I can. Uh, the topic, sir. Uh, uh, can I talk? Yeah. Uh, welcome, me, me, Ruby, ma'am. We are very happy to have you here, and uh, this is the topic uh, actually is a very less discussed still very important as a major <laughs> modality <laughs> of <laughs> so, welcome welcome ma'am uh, you can pay you can please start your talk firstly i want to thank uh, the akola abuji society and the entire community of obstetrician and gynecs who see pcos patient because uh, after the treatment, the patient always asks, uh, Doctor, I can eat what I can eat, what I can eat. And if we ask them, what they say looks correct. But uh, the reality is something different, which has got them to OT. So I think uh, this is a great opportunity for all the uh, clinicians here to uh, give them certain tips because all clinics may or may not have a dietitian in their setup. And sometimes they go and approach a dietitian who may not be qualified. So if we as clinicians give them the guidance at the time of counseling. I think it will be very important because like my previous speaker, Sujata, I've also said that the first line of treatment is lifestyle modification. And that does include uh, um, management by eating right. So to discuss this in further details, I'm going to share my slides. And it's very important because every now and then it is making headlines. Post uh, uh, COVID pandemic also, everywhere childhood obesity is at rise and it's considered more serious than the coronavirus. That childhood obesity, we know what the repercussions are. And a scientist, Dr. Chris Van, says that it's we know that lack of exercise, but it is not the only reason for obesity. It is mainly the food. And over the last two years, we know that people have picked up these ultra processed foods, which he calls it to be an edible junk. Every now and then newspapers all over the world mention that this is uh, also leading to the increased rise of PCOS cases. Now, if we look at our clinic level, at a level of our practice, we may uh, come across this case and everybody will be able to resonate it with such a case that a young girl who's appearing for a need, uh, she comes to your clinic who's been showing menstrual irregularities for the last couple of years. Now, she's been studying, so she away, stays awake late nights. There's no exercise in her routine, whatever weight gain has happened. Last two years have added to her excess weight. So BMI currently is 32 with a waist circumference of 92. You can see her clinical symptoms of hyperandrogenism. Her lipid profiles are also uh, very abnormal. She shows, she shows uh, low vitamin D and B12 levels and her USG, which may not be very important, but still she sees not only bulky ovaries, but also shows grade two fatty liver at this early age. So this patient was referred to me for her diet counseling. And when I took her uh, diet recall, I understood that she was a vegetarian and being the student, like many other students, she's been skipping breakfast most of the day because she wakes up a little late and lunch and dinner, she's very hungry. She has a Coke with her meals and evening time uh, while studying whatever she can do herself or buy Maggie or buy a packet of chips, she has it. And she's still uh, up till late night. So it can be the not only a cup of milk, but later on she may do some coffee for herself. She pick up a, picks up a packet of wafers, biscuits or chocolates. Throughout the day, she ends up drinking five to six cups of tea with sugar added to it. And uh, she is from a Gujarati community. So usually there is sugar or good in all the dals and vegetables. It's a typical Gujarati meal pattern. And over the weekend, either she goes out uh, in the coffee shops or she orders food from Zumato and Zuki. And this is, I think, for every adolescent girl who comes to our clinic. And this exactly is a replica of what studies have shown so far. There's been several uh, very recent study published in the uh, BMC Pediatric Journal, which shows that there are three major things. One is high consumption of unhealthy foods. These foods may be high in fat, high in sugar, and also high in salt. 
and there's a low consumption of the healthy foods and the eating behavior is different. So when we talk of high consumption of unhealthy foods, all the foods which actually are packaged, we must may highlight this because anything which is packaged has a lot of preservatives and sodium in it. And they're also fried. All the chips and wafers, anything that you order may have high. Sometimes girls say, you know, I don't have uh, any oily food. Our house is not made of oil. It's not made of oil. It's not made of oil. But even a piece of cake is high in fatty acids. Eating a couple of pieces of cheese is a pizza layered with extra cheese. Burgers with extra cheese are all high in fat and salt. Alcohol, alcohol consumption is very commonly seen in the uh, adult group. But now even in the young girls, even on birthday parties, weekends, they all have this. Younger children, uh, younger girls uh, have a love for sweets and desserts. We know that. And these wafers are creating havoc, we know. All these things are one of the uh, key observations of this study. Uh, they also, uh, at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, they consume uh, less amount of healthy, uh, low consumption of healthy foods. So this is a typo error, low consumption of healthy foods. Some girls think that they get uh, skin eruptions, boils because of the dairy. So there has been a myth that consumption of dairy products may lead to breakouts. So a lot of girls uh, consume less amount of dairy products, which is high in calcium and has probiotics, especially the curds and the butter. So low consumption of dairy products, meats and proteins. They don't know that even the dals and nuts have protein. So they cut down on the eggs or the chicken and the feet because some of them also are trying to become vegan. They think that veganism will lead to uh, less of these breakouts and uh, love for animals now have moving them to being vegan. And of course, we know they're very choosy, picky, choosy in uh, eating vegetables and fruits. So fruits generally happens either in the ready-made juice uh, containers that you get, juice bottles, and uh, they're very scared of vegetables. Even in a poha or upma, upon dila the side of the bhaji karta and they pakta the upma kata. So low consumption of healthy foods is very common in all our patients. And most important, their behavior, their attitude, and their choice of foods that they make. Most of the times nowadays, since they have the lectures on the phone, they have the laptop in front of them, they are speaking on the phone while eating, or they are talking to your friend, they're attending lectures, or they don't even know how much they're eating in front of them. What is kept? They don't even you ask them, what did you eat in this yesterday? They will not remember because the focus was not food, the focus was on the uh, screen. So there's a lack of concentration, what they're eating, and they dump food, so they don't know how much they end up eating. Another point which the earlier speaker mentioned is about their sleeping pattern because that's a very haywire sleeping pattern which they have. There is no physical activity at all. I remember as young girls and young boys in the earlier uh, late 90s, people would go down to play badminton, people would go down to play uh, dodgeball, lagori, and so many other things. Now, after finishing uh, eat food, then you're back on the bed or you're attending a class or a Zoom meeting in the middle of the night. And then long sitting hours, no physical activity at all. And many of them, the worst thing is that they, many of them actually follow online diets or celebrity diets, or they go to the gym and pick up a diet which is given to by a gym trainer or their friend who has lost weight. They will go on Instagram and follow these people and they try to pretend and try to uh, follow their diet. Or to, you know, because the doctor said to lose weight, they will follow anything and everything. And like uh, ma'am said earlier that yes, a lot of girls have eating disorders like anorexia, nervosa or bulimia. And we also know that during PMS, see, this is the growing years. Okay. Some, and a lot of girls have PMS also. So they need food, but they make wrong choices of food. And that leads to the imbalance uh, because of the poor choices of food they make. They eat all the unhealthy, which are dense in calories, high number of calories, but less in nutrients. So we call it as low nutrient, high calorie food that they consume. So what happens is out of the five food groups that we know, vegetables, fruits, dairy, non-veg cereals, they eat more of fat-rich foods. So there is a lack of micronutrient in the diet. And that micronutrient imbalance is both in the macronutrients and micronutrients. Among carbohydrates, we know that um, a low glycemic index, I'll come to that in a couple of slides later on, they tend to choose refined, all meda based products, breads, bakery, biscuits, everything is in the diet, and uh, which are low in uh, high in glycemic index. They have a very poor carb to uh, protein rich ratio and they end up having fats which are not healthy. So nuts to khate nahi, they don't like almonds, walnuts if you recommend, but they tend to eat cheese, they tend to have these ice creams at night, a lot of fat foods in the terms of wafers, trans fats, all packaged foods. So end up eating high amount of these high calorie foods. And we know that because of the wrong choices of the food, they are deficient in all these 
micronutrients. So the best way to deal with them is change their eating pattern. This kind of a chart can be put in your clinic or you can give a printout and it can be put in the file which is given to the patient. And that it is very simple. Instead of telling them what not to eat, if you tell them that you please include these every day in your diet. Among green leafy vegetables, at least one green leafy vegetable should be there. Sometimes they don't like eating palak and then they like dudhi ka bhaji and karela and bindi. No need to you know, suggest them those vegetables which you don't want to take. Because many people say, aap alu nahi khana, chawal nahi khana. But tell them what they should be eating. So one bhaji could be palak ka paneer or a palak ka paratha or a palak ka roti, which they may like. So that is the way they can incorporate one green leafy vegetable. Every day, they must be consuming anything which is made out of dairy, milk product. If they can, you can tell them you can have a mango, uh, uh, you know, lassi or a mango milkshake without sugar, which is homemade, instead of having something which is ready-made. So they can enjoy both the fruit and a milk, which is a low GI product. They must, uh, the family and the mother must start ordering a low-fat milk product, not give the malai or the cream. My girl is thin, let me give her that. So dairy can be low-fat milk. She should be encouraged to take healthy fats. So, shampoo nashte mein, which they generally pick up unhealthy foods, a handful of seeds and nuts should be a part of a daily diet. Tell the, the patient to include fruits with the skin. So, what happens? All the fiber is gone when you're eating an apple without a skin or a pear without a skin. So, encourage them that eat a fruit. You're allowed to eat a fruit. Even mango is okay. Of course, a cut mango would be better than, you know, eating two, three mangoes with the meal. Suggest them fruits can be a part of that. And when you ask them to increase the protein, when you specify eat non-veg at least three to four times a week, make sure it is not fried. It should not be butter chicken. It should not be Kentucky fried chicken. It should not be the chicken which is available at the McDonald's. It should be lean meat cooked at home, which is a non-fried preparation. So giving them a chart or putting it in your clinic helps them to pick up one food item from each food group so they get all nutrients from each food group. I would like to share this. 10 point key strategies that one must do to ensure that they're having a good lifestyle. One, nutrition education. Very important. You need not tell them blindly and give a printed diet sheet. Ye mat khau, ye mat khau. You need to educate why what is given. Why are you given protein? Why are you given fiber? Why are you not supposed to eat chocolates? Educating them will help them because some of these girls who are uh, lean, they may wonder why do they need to follow a diet? They may be having high body fat percentage, but we still need to them, uh, give them a low calorie diet. It may not be energy deficient. It should be nutrient dense. So education is very important. Tell the girls that if you want to buy something, because some girls may be, uh, you know, they've grown up enough. Mothers tell them, go and buy this and come. And the girls have their own choice of buying food at this age. So tell them to read nutrition label. Uh, you can actually share a link or ask them to go to the American uh, Dietetic Association ATA. And there are some videos on the YouTube, on Instagram, where they teach you how to read a nutrition label. To compare two packets, this is also 100 gram, this is also 100 gram, which is high in protein, which is high in fiber, which is low in sugar. Tell them what are the good things to eat, rather than telling them what not to eat. And very important is tell them how to eat. Even if they want, you're giving them correct food to eat. But what if they end up eating high in volume? Means if there is chapati in, so are we going to tell them to eat five chapatis? No, portion control is very important. For this, eating behavior means switch off your mobile phones, switch off your laptops when you're eating. Okay, drink a glass of water before you're eating. Drink adequate amount of water. These four or five tips, if you mention them in your diet plan, it will be really very helpful for them to change their eating behavior. And not to eat when they're hungry or stressed. Some girls usually get too stressed because of relationships or academic pressure. They tend to eat for as a comfort food. So eating behavior, we should tell them that if you're hungry, Drink a glass of water before you eat. If you're angry on somewhere, just go for a walk. Sit down, take five deep breaths. Don't go and open a packet of wafers or eat chocolates because you're angry on someone else. Also, we must encourage them to participate in the meal planning or cooking. So they may be studying for neat exams or other exams, but a weekly menu when the mother or anybody who's uh, you know involved in the cooking, they can tell them what are the foods which they like, which can be a part of the menu in advance. Engaging parents and family members is very important. We all know that. Another important thing which I want to emphasize is cultural remodeling. You may come across patients who actually have these eating disorders and follow celebrities. And they want to think that looking thin or size zero is being healthy. Okay, so we need to discourage that. We need to encourage the girls to follow sports women who bring medals to our country, who medals to encouraging sports is a complete cultural remodeling of these girls. 
increasing in the physical activity very important i come to the sites what we can advise them what kind of activity they should be doing and as clinicians we should support uh, and encourage deworming and supplementation because we may not be able to that's something which is beyond them which we need to work on so these 10 key strategies really help us correcting the nutrition imbalance and if they're lean they will reduce their body fat percentage and if they're obese they will lose their body weight so if there are two categories of girl if you want them to lose weight whatever is the current dietary intake we need to reduce 500 kilo calories from day and that you just have to tell that by doing this you are actually going to lose half kg of weight per week which is very very rewarding for them so you need to tell them this kind of a chart again can be put in your clinic or a printed sheet can be told where you need to tell them what carbohydrate what protein what omega 3 fatty acids and how you are supposed to eat typically our indian meals we know that are carbohydrate rich we are carb country whether it is east west north or south more than 60% of our diet is carb sakali utle avar chaha biscuit if they skip the breakfast they may not have even poa or upma again which is carbs lunch madhe chaha pati roti then vade pav sandhya kal chi chapati vagaira so every meal has carb but proteins are barely seen in the diet we may see only milk coming in the form of tea or a chaas and um, low non vegetarians they eat only once or twice or thrice a week so we need to uh, ensure that by Uh, changing the diet we not only changing the number of calories but also reducing the carbohydrate i will not discuss the study in details where they showed that by just reducing the not the color calories but reducing carbohydrate from 55% to 40% we are actually going to uh, see a great improvement in the insulin sensitivity and reduction of the adipose tissues so we need to tell them what type of carbohydrate anything which increases the sugar rapidly like a potato like a bread or anything which is made up of maida or the fried thing are actually going to increase because they are high glycemic index but anything which has fiber jaise bhi maine pehle bola ki instead of drinking a, a fruit juice if it's a fruit and milk combination a milk shake it will reduce the glycemic load of that particular thing right similarly if it is um, high in glycemic index they will also feel hungry again and again because a food which is low in glycemic index will have a slower gastric emptying and which also makes the patient feel a little more fuller so very simple thing you can give this chart a signal system we can call it ki jo food red mein hai you are going to limit that blue and green is ad libitum so you can take simple changes instead of having a small grain kolam ka rice if you take a basmati rice it is lower in glycemic index as compared to a small rice now there are girls who want sweet uh, flakes so rather than buying a corn flakes you tell them to buy a millet based or a, or a quick oats which they can take so the glycemic index is lower of that particular uh, food similarly in um, if they want to eat potato it should not be a boiled potato ka but they can move to sweet potato so the cravings are lesser uh, all the millets are comparatively better in terms of the glycemic index among the fruits also they can uh, You need not worry about mango. That can I eat mango if I have pieces? Yes, you can provide it. What time you are eating and how much protein you are going, to, what time you are going to take and how much portion you are going to consume. Uh, this again talks about that low glycemic index is very effective in management. And there are multiple studies, not only this, which prove that. Uh, what you need to do is to make the food lower in glycemic index. You replace the carb with protein. Means, if three chapati eat, so you must reduce it to one chapati and some amount of vegetable or protein with it. But make sure that the patient consumes 0.8 to 1 gram of per kg water. This much of education and uh, you must pass on to your patient so that she knows that how much protein she is actually consuming at this point in time. So to by replacing this, you are actually going to reduce her waistline as well, and of course reduces the abdominal fat fat as well. So if she is a non-vegetarian, she has many options. She has all the lean meats. She has egg, which is an excellent source of protein. we have uh, milk and milk products like curd butter milk paneer and of course non vegetarians can also have fish thrice a week because it will also give uh, omega 3 fatty acids the girls who are vegetarian like our case which we discussed she need not worry she can have a lot of nuts in her diet which will give a good quality fatty acids and high in protein all the dals pulses and soya are also rich in proteins vegetables generally don't have protein it's the meat and the pulses which have protein and incorporating seeds also will increase so what you need to tell them is jo bhi aata hai banaya hua uske andar you can add the dal like a dal ka paratha dal ka chapati or a dal dal ke vegetable roll can be made you get skim milk powder in the market where whichever is the curd or the buttermilk you can add 1 teaspoon in it or the aata that skim milk powder can be added 
these tips can really help soya is available in different forms even soya nuts is available so giving these choices will help them to increase the protein in whatever they are currently eating coming to the fats make sure this is mentioned in the prescription the total fat allowed is only half a kg per person per month if it's a family of four this means 2 kg of oil butter ghee everything put together that will actually make the calorie intake of less than 30% of calories coming from the fat mention that the foods which are high in omega 3 fish oil flaxseed oil chia seeds are a part of the diet and tell them the best oil which they can use is the use of rice bran oil groundnut oil olive oil mustard oil canola oil or soybean oil giving them tips will help them choose the right thing Uh, just change some ingredients suppose it's a girl whose intake is 2000 kilo calories and you want to reduce 500 kilo calories don't ask them to reduce dals and vegetables but make sure you remove the sugar from the diet and the oil from the diet that itself will reduce the carbohydrate content of the diet and still the proteins will remain same or add proteins so it will increase the number of protein so tell them that instead of eating corn flakes have oats in the morning instead of chapati or puri it has to be multi grain roti instead of having a sweet lassi in the evening make butter milk biscuits ke jagah pe you can take nuts so just change of the item will help them do that uh, just simply changing the ingredient will help for example using instead of aloo for north indian you can tell them you can use paneer or vegetable for the stuffing so if it's puri make a the simple tandoori roti if you are going to restaurants similarly if you are eating rice ka dhokla if a patient is from gujarat has dhokla every morning it can be sprouted mung which will increase the protein content Instead of eating fried mutia, it can be steam mutia. Instead of eating a plain chilla, it can be a mung ka chilla. Just change of ingredients will change the whole nutrient value of the food and reduce the calorie density. Another important point is not to forget the use of probiotics. Ah, uh, probiotics because we know there is a gut dysbiosis because of the intake of high fat and low fiber diet, and which we know is causing the inflammatory leaky gut. Uh, so by adding probiotics we are going to reduce the inflammatory state of the body and for probiotics what we need to do is introduce products which are available in the market curd and buttermilk also are similar to probiotics the definition of probiotic is which has a fixed number of organisms in it please do not go by the product names i am not promoting any product this is just to uh, make you understand that when there is a product available in the market they will be clearly mentioned it's a probiotic dahi or a probiotic drink or a probiotic yogurt which can be taken by one probiotic every day in a long run will increase the good bacteria in the gut and reduce the harmful bacteria uh, in spite of saying all this we still face a lot of challenges because these girls don't adhere to the diet because of other issues that we see that is a love for chocolates or you know uh, they are completely driven by the packaged food so if we tell them to eat healthy they may not read the nutrition label there are some products in the market which are without nutrition label so tell them not to buy anything which does not mention what is the ingredient of that uh, and if you tell them home food khaiye to home food should not be like a fasting diet where there is everything starchy okay and these offers are very very tempting we know that so no matter how much we say they still go for it over the weekend and uh, they sitting all the time which is another challenge that we are all facing so running walking is barely done nowadays and we know that so sitting is new smoking so when you are counseling a patient instead of giving them a printed diet if you mention few things and tell them portion control is very important set very realistic smart goals like earlier what doctor said i think while counseling we should be telling at the end of it she should tell me are mai itna sab khaun kha sakti hu kya do i need to eat all this will i lose weight so it should be more of volume but less of calories and tell them to monitor everything make a food diary write your whatever you are eating and check your weight every week not every day this will motivate that sirf half a kg kam karna hai don't set a goal of 10 15 kg only 2 kg per month shows a very motivating and rewarding uh, uh, kind of thing so counseling them for mindful eating is very important then they should you know know what they are eating not blindly eat stop doing multitasking when you are eating drink more amount of water uh, tell them to choose a smaller plate if you look at this picture there are same amount of food in all three plates only because this plate is smaller the amount looks more so change the type size of food tell them aap kitna vegetable kha sakte ho kitna rice kha sakte ho this kind of a picture will really help them how much quantity of food they should be consuming for those who don't understand you can tell them ki you brace eat the smallest category there are three categories in this uh, slide the smallest category should be your rice 
and the largest katori should be your vegetable so if you tell them to bring these katoris to my house you can help them understand what is a small katori and what is a large katori and uh, educate them that yes whether it is sugar or honey or jaggery it's still simple carbohydrate which is a no 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 for them uh, this i think should be a part of everybody's uh, uh, clinic in front of them the girl should see that only three things in one meal they end up eating 2000 calories but a pura din mein if they eat homemade cooked food vegetable salad they just still don't end up consuming 2000 kilo calories this plate uh, is again available in um, the american Di dietetic association where it shows that your plate should not be 50% like this one where there is rice and roti 50% is carbohydrates in this plate only one corner is rice roti and anything starchy the remaining portion is filled with uh, grains and vegetables 50% is vegetables whether it is salad or bhaji of your choice but not starchy and other uh, one fourth is only protein so dahi all this so if this plate and this plate has a huge difference in terms of carbohydrate this is more than 50% and this is only uh, 25 to 30% in this plate you give them the choices so if they are hungry in the evening they need not eat a chocolate bar they can eat anything like a chikki they can eat ragi laddus instead of eating and sweet they can have eggs when they are hungry in the evening a katori of dahi that should be enough a simple menu could be in the morning instead of having a high calorie uh, biscuits and tea it can be a light green tea it can be good nashta with one egg mid morning need not be very heavy it can be a glass of chaas with chia seeds because chia seeds give you omega 3 fatty acids lunch and dinner can be a uh, simple home food with only one fourth of it having carbs remaining of vegetables and proteins tea time and bed time a cup of tea or a cup of milk at bed time will help them to eat healthy all through the day there should be a warning to them that if they eat burger over the weekend full week you eaten well but if you eat a burger you need to walk for 5 hours to burn that many calories and if you eat a 12 inch cheese pizza uh, which is like a whole week's allowance you have to walk for 8 hours to burn that so you need to tell them that physical activities of course indeed unfortunately even the who says that 85% of the adolescent girls don't even do any kind of physical activity but we need not tell them to join a gym all the time we need to tell them whatever they like ask them what would they like to do which is sustainable not for a week or 10 days they can either join a dance class with their friends now uh, dan garba is going to be very soon in a couple of months they can join a garba class okay they can simply go for walk some girls are shy going in the group so tell them you can take a, your dog for a walk just go running everywhere if mom has asked you to go and buy something don't um, you know take your scooty or take an auto rickshaw or take your car go walking or go cycling to pick what you want to buy if you are at home so there are two things one is a cardio activity which they can do by running or swimming the other thing is weight training or resistance training which they can do even at home by doing these flexibility exercises or they can join a pilates class or a weight training class strengthening is equally important to preserve the lean body mass so let's remember that and uh, of course if they are studying if they have lot of stress for whatever reason few minutes of breathing exercises is is enough no need to tell them yoga you can just say breathing exercises every day six days a week will help him so this fit principle of how much what to do should be a part of the prescription whether it is a diet plan prescription or whether it is your medical prescription it should be clearly mentioned on the sheet last few lines this is the summary that you need to give these pointers tell them to eat four to five meals which is healthy ones tell them to uh, pick up low glycemic index meal one meal should have one protein item and every meal should have a protein and ask them to have uh, all foods which are rich in omega 3 and one probiotic drink or uh, any other product should be a part of their diet my last slide which um, all throughout my presentation i kept saying that uh, it's not so difficult so your diet is a very friendly solution diet diet is not really dieting it is eating correct and it's not so different that you have to start taking avocados and things like that whatever you are taking it has to be modified slightly and make sure that your plate is full with vegetables and only less than half is coming from carbohydrates and make sure that whether you run or jog or go for a walk with your friend there has to be physical activity on a daily basis and of course the entire family is responsible no not the girl herself so we need to take a family into confidence before they do any change for a long term health benefits so with this last slide i want to thank everybody for their patient hearing i'm sorry if i've exceeded my time but i stop sharing my slides here thank you so much
Thank you, Ruby, ma'am, for Nutrigia's talk. It was very informative and phenomenal lecture. Uh, Take-home messages are uh, adolescent obesity has become an epidemic now. Uh, it's mainly due to high consumption of unhealthy food and low consumption of healthy food and inappropriate behavior, uh, behavior habits like uh, sedentary lifestyle, sleeping in the after eating, uh, following online uh, diet plans, skipping breakfast and dinner. So we should advise patients what to eat rather than telling them what not to eat. Uh, their diet should mainly include all five food groups like uh, veg vegetables, dairy products, which includes mainly low-fat milk and its products, uh, fats, that includes healthy fats, which, in, uh, which includes seeds and nuts, fruits with seeds, and in non-vegetarian food, they can eat lean meat and non-fried food. Key strategies to correct nutritional imbalance are, uh, we have to give them nutrition education, educate them about uh, nutrition labeling, encourage healthy eating lifestyle, encourage them to eat food with a low glycemic index, and shift the food from uh, carbs to protein diet. Every meal should include at least one protein fat. And the, uh, cultural rebonding also we have to teach them. We have to encourage them to uh, follow sports women and discourage following celebrities. Uh, we also have, need to pay them patients to increase uh, physical activity. We need to give them deworming agents uh, and also probiotics and if needed, other supplementation. Uh, thank you, ma'am, once again. Now, uh, now I would like to request Dr. Sneha Agrawal, our joint secretary, uh, for further uh, uh, sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Prerna. Good evening, everyone. We had an amazing talk of Dr. Sujata Kar, ma'am, and Dr. Ruby, ma'am. Now I would like to request Rupali, ma'am, to introduce Fessy Lewis, sir, for talk on PCOS-related infertility. I think introduction already over, I think. So we will... Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, sir. You can please start. Okay. Sorry for that technical problem. So without wasting time, as you are running, running short, I will go and straight into the topic of PCOS and infertility. We have heard about uh, lifestyle modification and, uh, uh, and also the adolescent uh, PCOS management. So whatever we tell about the... Uh, and, uh, PCOS and infertility, we must always know about the natural ovulatory cycles. So as you all know, by right from the MBBS time, we will be learning about the HPO axis. From the hypothalamus, GNRH is produced in the pulsatile fashion. With this, the, from the pituitary FSH and LH is produced, and that produces the uh, follicles and the estrogen from the ovaries. So in the body, there is a remarkable, remarkable coordination between the HPO axis and the other pulsatile fashion is very important. So when we look into the PCOS, uh, the, it, about the main problem about the ovulatory disturbance, you look into WHO classification, it comes under the PCOS uh, group two, which is normal onotropic, normal estrogenic, which is the most uh, commonest uh, type of uh, 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 ovulatory problem in infertility practice. But we must always rule out when the patient comes, whether there is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, that is the uh, type 1 is there. That is, uh, in those patients, there will be FSH will be very less, less than 2, LH also will be less, ET also will be, le will be less. So that is the one which you have to rule out. Otherwise, when we are seeing for a patient in infertility patients, we must always look into the uh, why we are uh, uh, doing the ovulation induction, when we are doing to the patient and how we are doing and whether the, they are together, the couple is together, all those things. So all together we have to look into, look into when we are dealing with infertility and PCOS. And if you look through the step-by-step -step of the infertility management of PCOS, the most important is the lifestyle, lifestyle changes, what we have already uh, had a wonderful talk. Uh, and next is the ovulation induction per se, and also metformin and other insulin sensitizing drugs, and laparoscopic ovarian drilling, and in, lastly is the in vitro fertilization. Lifestyle modification and, uh, and the diet and exercise, uh, it must be the first line of treatment of management of in, infertile women with PCOS, especially if they are obese or overweight. And I just put this uh, to just show that 
if the weight loss of 5 to 10% over 6 months is effective in re-establishing ovulatory function in more than 50% of the obese women. And there are studies, these are our older studies, just to tell that even the, uh, about 1995 on which to 2004, there are a lot of studies just by weight loss alone that will restore the ovulatory function in PCOS with the obese PCOS. So uh, as we have already seen in heard in uh, uh, detail about the lifestyle modification, we'll go into the ovulation induction per se. <clears throat> so if you look into the ovulation induction, we have to uh, look into the this aspect uh, uh, in the Wait a minute, let me minimize the other thing. Okay, uh, if you look, uh, we must look into the uh, duration of the FSH stimulation, what we usually occur when there is FSH stimulation from the follicles, estrogen is produced and the estrogen has got a negative feedback effect. So that will uh, suppress the uh, other follicles. So there is atresia of the other follicles. So the usually there will be monofollicular uh, development is occurring. This is what normally occur uh, in the body. So in, in PCOS patient, there is supraphysiological synthesis of estrogen. So the estrogen negative feedback signals to the hypothalamus is affected. There is, uh, uh, there is uh, low GNRH production with the positive feedback on the LH. So there is uh, ultimately there is low FSH and there is the follicles does not develop and that lead to anovulation. That is what happening in the PCOS and that is what the cause for anovulation and infertility in PCOS patients. So in PCOS, there is estrogen feedback is disturbed. The selection of the dominance follicle is affected. Diagnosis, but I'm not going to that because I am, uh, it is, uh, there is a uh, 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 first talk we had about adolescence and how the latest consensus about that. Latest consensus is that there you must use a higher frequency. There must be follicle number per ovary, FNPO must be 20 in each ovary to, for, uh, for the uh, diagnosis. And there is Rotterdam criteria is still there even with the latest consensus uh, of uh, uh, PCOS management. Whatever be that aim must be to go for a mono ovulation as far as possible. And also we must look into when we go for ovulation induction, we must, our aim is to correct the ovulatory disorders uh, by uh, correcting the anovulation or disovulation and we aim so, uh, at superovulation that is uh, uh, hello can you hear me now now we can hear you but uh, slide is it visible uh, yes sir it's visible it is visible sir Okay, okay. In my screen, it became uh, invis not visible. Okay. One, so one second. I'm using my son's laptop because there was some uh, problem with the other. Second, I'm going to check with that another device. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you're audible. The slide isn't visible, sir. You have to stop share and again share the slide. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay, I'm using uh, two different sources that I saw for that. The slides are visible too. Yes, 
Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, basically the uh, ovulation index um, um, part we are uh, uh, dealing with. So uh, uh, in some instances, when we wanted to use uh, super ovulation for IUI, we aim at two to three follicles. Otherwise, basically for IVF, it is controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. And the drugs for ovarian stimulation is, uh, as you all know, metformin, anti-estrogen, clomiphene, cipate, and tamoxifen is there, aromatase inhibitors, letrozole is there, gonatropin, HMG, purified FSH, and recumbent FSH are there. So basically, uh, we'll start with clomiphene cipate. It's a partially selective estrogen receptor. Uh, uh, it induces a change in the GNRH uh, pulse uh, frequency uh, and increases the FSH level and promotes follicular development and used since 1960s. We have been using for many years. The problem with clomiphene citrate is that it has got high ovulation rate, uh, but the pregnancy rate is less. That is, if you are having an ovulation rate between 60 to 85 percent in most of the studies, pregnancy rate is 30 to 40 percentage only. And let us see what happens in clomiphene citrate. There is a depletion of estrogen receptors in the pituitary and hypothalamus due to the prolonged stimulation. So the, the estrogen feedback loop gets interrupted. So FSH is secreted in turn, increase leading to multiple follicle growth. But since the half-life is more, and since the CC binding to receptors is more, the uh, inhibition part is not acting, uh, acting there. So it leads to multiple follicle development and multiple pregnancy and hyperstimulation is more common with clomiphene. The other problem with clomiphene is that, in addition to that, there is anti-estrogen effect uh, uh, we're on the endometrium and the cervix. That's why endometrial thickness is usually less and there is decreased uterine blood flow. So the uh, the uh, cervix also is getting, mucus also is getting affected. So the miscarriage rate is high. And how do we give the clomiphene separate? We give for five days, start from second to fifth day. There is no difference when you start on second day or fifth day. And starting dose is 50. And usually we can give up to 150 milligram, but I personally give up to 100 milligram because of the anti-estrogenic eff, uh, effect. And uh, uh, and uh, when we give clomiphene, the uh, risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is 4 to 10 percentage of risk of oasis is there. And there is distribution uh, between the ovulation rate and the pregnancy rate, as I told initially. And obese PCOS women tend to have clomiphene resistance. And clomiphene is the current first line uh, according to the Sassensky CSRM criteria. I'm telling about 2008 area, uh, eight, uh, that is the ASHRAE ASRM, that European ASRM consensus, which came in 2008. They were telling uh, uh, clomiphene as the first line. I'll, I'll come to that. And uh, uh, if you look with the results of the clomiphene citrate, the discrepancy, as I told, no, this is one uh, big meta analysis of 5,878 cases which uh, published in 2002 uh, that tells the uh, ovulation rate of 70 to 86 percent but the pregnancy rate of 34 to 43 percentage only and the miscarriage rate of 13 to 25 percentage and if you look into the uh, 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 the if you combined uh, uh, if you uh, go on giving clomiphene for longer period that is even up to 12 12 months there is still there is a gap of uh, ovulation and the uh, Frenzy rate is there. That means even if you give more period of clomiphene, and also still there will be a gap of uh, uh, frenzy rate, ovulation and the frenzy rate. So that is mainly because of two in, uh, things. One is clomiphene resistance and clomiphene failure. Resistance is failure to ovulate after two to three successive cycles of clomiphene at a maximal dose of 20 to 30 percentage. And clomiphene failure is the woman who responds normally to clomiphene but fails to continue after six cycles of treatment. That is, most of the studies tell that clomiphene resistance is 20 to 30 percentage and failure is almost up to 60 percentage. And, and according to the Tatsunsky's criteria, what uh, if there is clomiphene resistance, is there, especially if there is obese patient, we have to again go for a lifestyle modification, weight loss, uh, if the, especially if the BMI is more than 29, uh, 29. And in non obese, we can give uh, metformin combined with clomiphene or change into letrozole. And then, still not responding, we can go for gonadotropin or laparoscopic ovarian release. We can be uh, tried. Lastly, only IVF. This is as for, according to the 2008 
essentially as SRA as RM criteria. So uh, next thing when we look into the PCS management is the aromatase inhibitors. So what is this aromatase inhibitors? Most commonly used is letrozole. First series of ovulation injection was done by Bitwali group and came in 2000. And the other molecule which says uh, even the not uh, licensed in India is anastrozole. These are the third generation aromatase inhibitors. It has got, letrozole has got a shorter half-life of 45 hours. Thus, there are no adverse effect on estrogen target tissues there. If you look into the pharmacokinetic, it is rapidly and completely uh, absorbed within one hour with uh, more than 99% bioavailability there. And T half is uh, uh, 45 hours and well treated and well tolerated drug. And let us see the, how this uh, uh, letrozole act. It inhibits on the aromatase in ovaries and peripheral tissues, reducing the estrogen level. So there is this negative feedback effect is there. It stimulates the HPV axis. So the GNRH releases the FSH. FSH mediated stimulation of the follicle is there. But the, since the half-life is uh, less, the rise in estrogen level from the follicle suppresses the FSH, leaving a single bottom, uh, dominant follicle. So the uh, uh, multiple follicle development and hyperstimulation is less with the letrozole or aromatase inhibitors. So this is how when you compare with clomiphene and letrozole, you see initially there is a stimulatory effect of uh, by the increasing FSH in, if you look in the day five, when we compare with clomiphene and letrozole. But if you look into day 10, there is uh, uh, in clomiphene, there is persistent estrogen receptor depletion due to the long half-life of clomiphene is there. So the FSH is still perceived high. But in, in letrozole, the rising estrogen level due to the short half-life of aromatase inhibitors restore the estrogen negative feedback on the endogenous gonad dropping, leading to the selection of dominant follicle and, and monofollicular ovulation as far as possible. So the chance of hyperstimulation is this. So this is how we, if we compare day 5 and day 10, comparing the clomiphene and letrozole, how it will be. So how will you give letrozole? We can give, two, starting with 2.5 milligram, a single day, we can start uh, up to 7.5 milligram. We can start any day from three to even up to seven days because of the half life is less. And people, uh, Metwali has tried uh, 20 milligram single dose at day three also, or step, uh, step up protocol that is in the and uh, day two, one tab, two tablet, then three tablet, then four tablet, and five tablet that is step up protocol. These two uh, trials, there is no much uh, trials are available in the literature. Uh, and uh, the another protocol which I've been using and uh, I've, uh, I think uh, I forgot to put in this is the uh, extended letrozole. Extended letrozole, 2.5 milligrams starting from the day one or two for 10 days. And recently there are one study about extended letrozole with 5 milligram from the uh, day one or two for 10 days also is available. So further the sense of hyperstimulation is less with that. And letrozole uh, with clomiphene, so there are a lot of studies. This one earlier study came in 2015, which came in the gynecologist and endocrinology. Uh, it was an RCT trial. Seven studies were included uh, uh, out of the 232 selected. And there was uh, 1,800 patients with 900 patients in each arm. And uh, their conclusion was that uh, if you look into the live birth rate, it was better with the letrozole. If you look into the pregnancy rate, that also is better with uh, letrozole. And they concluded that letrozole is superior to clomiphene considering live birth rate and pregnancy rate in patients with PCOS. And initially, we were using extensively from 2002, but in 2008, there was some concern about the safety aspect of letrozole and uh, mainly the uh, congenital anomalies. And this is one study which came initially to plus uh, study from Canada. There is no difference in the overall rate of major and minor congenital anomalies. Afterwards, a lot of studies have came. This is one meta-analysis which came in 2015. An Indian study by Sarma uh, uh, Satal came in 2014. And uh, uh, latest, uh, 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 which I could get is 2017, of nearly 4,000 patients with the Tatsumi et al. study came, all telling that, uh, accord, and uh, by the, even the current evidence that letrozole use does not increase the chance of congenital anomalies in newborn, which came in BMJ also in 2017. So if you compare with letrozole and clomiphene, and the half-life of uh, letrozole is very short, and estrogen effect uh, is, uh, is very less in, in the endometrium and the cervical mucosa, uterine blood flow is not affected, miscarriage rate is less, 
OHS rate is less and multiple frames delay rate is less. So when the Tesselsky criteria uh, in 2007, which published in 2008, tell us the first line was chromophene. In, but according to the uh, international evidence-based consensus on PCOS, which came in 2008, they clearly tell the uh, letrozole is the first line management. And we can also use chromophene. We can use combined chromophene with met metformin. We can use metformin alone, but the FKC is less also. We can use gonotropin also. Uh, as the, uh, in the second line, and uh, uh, and second line, we can also use uh, go for laparoscopic ovarian surgery, and lastly only the IVF, even in the latest consensus. Even though we, if you look into the literature, there are a lot of studies with chromophen and met metformin. There is not much studies with letrozole and metformin, even though we have been using extensively. So uh, before coming into letrozole, we can look into the gonadotropin also. So gonadotropin, the purpose is to uh, initiate and maintain the follicular growth, which may be uh, achieved by increasing, transient increase in the FSH above a threshold dose for sufficient duration to uh, to generate the limited number of developing follicles. So uh, this was a, a PCOS clip. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, it is not coming. The, it was showing typical bulky ovary with six trauma. It's a uh, large ovarian volume more than 10, with more than 10 andral follicle was there. That was the typical patient in which we have, can use gonadotropin. Uh, but here also, let us see what uh, what is the, uh, how does the uh, gonadotropin actually, here the duration of FSH secretion is increased by the exogenous FSH injections, more smaller follicles stimulated to grow the, uh, with the continuous support of the FSH. The problem is that there is a, a continuous exogenous FSH is there, so there is multiple follicle development, risk of hyperstimulation and multiple frequency is more with gonadotropin. How do you overcome that? There are different preparations are that few HMG preparations are there, which contains FSH and LH, highly purified, which contains only if there is 75 unit of FSH, one unit of LH only, or there is recombinant FSH, it is purely recombinant, which is produced by, not from the urinary product, it is by the recombinant technology, uh, and it doesn't contain LH. But even with that, there can be a hyper stimulation can be there. So, and for the the cost with the gonadotropin is more so for routine ovulation injection other than uh, IVF we can use chromophene or letrozole start from the second or six uh, to, to six day uh, uh, either by 550 or 100 milligram chromophene or 2.55 milligram of letrozole combined with the HMG or FSH 75 units or uh, 150 units after the chromophene or letrozole this is the most uh, cost effective method for uh, ovulation injection of PC but when you use gonadotropin, you must always monitor for uh, hyperstimulation and then only may uh, decide I will come to that. So alternatively, we can use gonad uh, gonadotropin alone because the incidence of hyperstimulation with chromophene we combined with gonadotropin is high. And even though it is less, can occur with letrozole with gonadotropin. Is, is there. That's why uh, people have tried extended letrozole uh, for 10 days and then if needed, added gonadotropin uh, for ovarian stimulation. So uh, gonadotropin alone, we can go for a step-up protocol. We gradually increase the dose uh, till the follicle is 10 millimeter and then continue that this is the step-up protocol. Step down is that we uh, go for higher dose when the follicle is 10 millimeter, decrease that. Or sequential when you go step up and followed by step down. What would be that? Uh, the, the dose of gonadotropin you needed is more, the cost is more. Even with this, the hyperstimulation can occur. Step down, it looks uh, uh, attractive because when you reduce the dose, but when we reduce the uh, dose, uh, the it can, follicles can collapse and it can affect the oocyte quality. And whatever with that, we have to need regress for, uh, monitoring of the follicles when you are using gonadotropin alone. Starting dose with classic step up protocol is 75, uh, in, in dose increased after six days with 75 milligram. The same dose is continued till a follicle is 80 millimeter. People have tried low dose by increasing 37.5 uh, chronic low dose where they started with 50 and increased only after 14 days. This is what recommended of gonadotropin, the sustenance criteria. But you must be always careful that uh, patient also will get impatient, cost will be more, and doctor also will get impatient. It is more um, uh, followed in uh, U U European countries where the cost is uh, of the gonadotropin supported by the health system. Here in India, uh, patient has to 
to take the cost of that uh, of the gonadotropin stimulation. So most accepted is the clomiphene or letrozole followed by gonadotropin for thimble ovarian stimulation for the PCOS patient. Alternatively, we can go for GnRH agonist and followed by agonist that is suppressed HPO axis. Uh, and then, do, but here also cost is more. I will come to that when we're going for IVF. And one word about the metformin. Metformin, when used for ovulation injection, just for alone, uh, it is not found to be very effective. But when we combine with plumpine, it has got a, a, a better ovulation rate and conception rate. And uh, I don't know, there is not much studies about letrozole with metformin, even though we are using and getting reasonably good results. And there are a lot of studies when you uh, combine metformin and uh, with uh, uh, um, for ovarian stimulation for IVU stimulation, there are uh, it it is found to be reduced chance of hyperstimulation when you uh, uh, use metformin, especially if you pre treatment with the previous one month and continue it during ovarian stimulation, chance of hyperstimulation is less even for IVU IVU or control ovarian stimulation. So laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Uh, uh, we can use uh, a monopolar cautery or laser. There is no much sense uh, uh, using laser for that. And uh, uh, and the thing is that we have to limit the number of uh, uh, holes for the ovary. Uh, uh, limit for four. If it is more, more raw area will be there. More chance of addition will be there. But whatever it may, we have to be careful that when you go for uh, uh, for even the textbook to tell about four milliseconds, uh, four millimeter. If it is a bulky ovary with six trauma, uh, 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 if we have to, oh, I mean, cauterize the trauma a little more, then only we'll get the desired effect. But you must select the uh, patient properly because it's not, not just by uh, ultrasound report of PCOS go for that, especially now the diagnostic criteria is fixed. Uh, and also if the previous, there is a, a, an, a, an ovulation with Routine ovulation injection and um, for the PCOS patient, then only go for a laparoscopic ovarian. That is, it has to be used as a second line only, not as a first line, and for PCO ovarian drilling and properly identify the patients with PCO ovary. And next is the last is the uh, uh, over, uh, control over hyperstimulation for uh, IVF. The basic principle is that uh, I told no previously about GnRH is produced in pulsatile fashion from hypothalamus and from pituitary FSHL is produced. So in uh, in a control over and hyperstimulation, when we give exogenous GnRH agonist or antagonist, the GnRH pulsatility is, is so, so there is no endogenous FSHLH. We give exogenous FSH and with that the follicles are developing. And when the follicles are ready, we give exogenous HCG. The follicles usually rupture within 36 hours. Before that, we retrieve the say That is the uh, uh, routine uh, over control over hyperstimulation. This is the GnRH agonist protocol where we initially give the desensitized we using the GnRH agonist. And initially, there will be a LH surge will be a first LH surge will be there. Uh, and uh, uh, and afterwards, the uh, HP axis is suppressed when we give agonist. And then after the periods when if the endometrium is seen for no residual uh, functional cysts, we give add the gonadotropins and the, and monitor the patient. And when it is ready, we give the HCG. In uh, we can this is a long protocol. Initially, we, we were also were using the short protocols where we start on second third day gonadotropins and uh, GnRH agonist in a higher dose. It's not very, very much popular now. And GnRH antagonist is we need not have to suppress. We start gonadotropins uh, uh, right from the second or third day when the follicles is 14 millimeter or after five days, that is fixed protocol or flexible protocol, we add the antagonist. The advantage of antagonist is there is no flare up effect. Uh, we directly suppress the receptors and uh, when the follicles is ready, we give the HCG. That is the, uh, that is how we prevent the LH surge in these patients with the antagonist protocol. The other advantage with the, uh, uh, antagonist is the uh, antagonist protocol is that if the patient is hyperstimulation, especially PCOS patient, uh, instead of the GNR, uh, HCG, here is the HCG, instead of HCG, we give GNRH agonist like lucrolide or propylene. And the, so uh, this agonist is capable of displacing the antagonist from the receptors and inducing the activation that is flare up effect, which usually occurs when the agonist receptors are uh, acting uh, uh, by the agonist. And that flyer is used for the final oocyte maturation and the follicles rupture. 
and this is more uh, successful and safer alternative, especially in patients that respond as like PCOS patients. The chance of hyper uh, hyperstimulation is or very very less less than one percent. The problem is that there is corpus luteal insufficiency will be there. Uh, we have to freeze the uh, oocytes or embryos and uh, transfer in subsequent seconds. Only if they are having the facilities for uh, 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 embryo freezing, we have to use that. People have tried uh, HCG in the luteal phase in a smaller dose and got pregnancies, but again, that will take the advantage of uh, having the hyperstimulation in those patients. So in PCOS, uh, we, the aim must be to prevent hyperstimulation. We must, uh, with the experience of uh, ovulation induction therapy and recognition of the risk factors for OSS uh, has to be done. We have to individualize the ov ovarian ovulation induction regimes carefully with careful monitoring of USG and doubtful cases with E2 le uh, level and use of minimum dose of gonadotropin and minimum duration of gonadotropin therapy to necessary to achieve the goal of preventing hyperstimulation, preventing the multiple pregnancy as far as possible. So just one word about, uh, uh, one word about the ovarian reserve. You know about, you know about FSH inhibiting estradiol IMH as the baseline hormonal ovarian reserve markers, and ultrasound markers are ovarian antral follicle count and ovarian volume. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the main problem is that there is no proper way to select the stimulation protocol according to that we can tailor made regarding uh, by looking to the uh, uh, to the ovarian markers. Most important is that if there is antral follicle count is more than 40, 40, uh, 40, uh, 14, there is high risk of uh, hyperstimulation. You must be very careful in stimulation. We have to select the patient thinking it is the hyper responders. Uh, but there are limitations for uh, AFC and follicle count because uh, we need a good ultrasound. You, somebody must be from your team must be able to do the ultrasound, and it is very much subject to over in volume. If the volume is more, we must be very careful. AMH definitely AMH. There is no standard cutoff for above which patient can go for uh, hyperstimulation initially to as tall as 5.4. Now it, there are some studies there. Are, we have if the AMS level is more than 3.5. We must be, there is high chance it, go, it can go for hyper responders. Even the latest consensus doesn't tell that we must not rely on AMS as a cutoff uh, point about uh, when we can uh, tell it as hyper responders. Uh, uh, till the largest studies, multi centric studies, has come with the, uh, uh, and more important, the standardization of the AMS estimation is also very important because the most labs. Uh, initially, there were a lot of problem about standardization. Now it is more reliable. So as a, as a whole, if you look at a responders, if it is more than five, definitely it can. And even though I told you know, there are some studies now, uh, if it is more than 3.5, we have to think about hyper responders, the patient about the PCOS patient. The day three FSH in PCOS patient, uh, it doesn't really imply about that. So uh, to uh, look into the hyper responders, uh, we must be always looking to the uh, AMH, AMH value and the AFT and the follicle count. These are the two things in PCOS patient we have to really see, see and then decide about the ovarian stimulation protocol in those patients. And the other OSS identifying in high risk factors are, uh, uh, are if the young patients less than 35. Uh, if the P over is really PCOS by the by, by the larger antral follicle, if it's a thin built patients, uh, if there is typical necklace pattern uh, pattern is there, HCG must not be given for luteal phase support, and uh, previous history of uh, OHS is very important. History serum is not a level at the uh, day of uh, ovulation trigger. If it is more than 4,000, we must be really careful. What or be that when ovulation injection for infertile patients with PCOS, we must do for all. Uh, ultrasound monitoring, preferably transvaginal sonogram, we must see the number and size of follicle pattern and thickness of the endometrium. Output case, we must go for an estradiol level. And, uh, uh, and according to that, we have to see that if we are putting over in stimulation, uh, for, in, if we are suspecting hyperstimulation, we can either cancel the cycle or give the GNR a uh, uh, trigger for routine uh, triggering. So we have to counsel the patient and the chance of hyperstimulation in those patients. So, uh, so to conclude, uh, for a PCOS patient, when we are uh, uh, going for ovarian stimulation, we may, if doubtful cases, we must go for a, or analyze of the ovarian reserve, define the goal of the ovarian stimulation, parts of ovarian stimulation, we are aiming that. 
select the correct stimulation in that patient and the search for newer drugs, refinements, and adjustments of the ovulation detection regimes with purpose of finding the ideal protocol that combines efficacy, safety, economy, and good patient complaints and ex excellent clinical outcomes still continue as we can evolve over the years. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Fessy Lewis, sir, for such an amazing talk on PCOS related in infertility and enlightening practical applications of ovulation induction drugs and expanding our knowledge for the same. Take home messages from the talk are what is the aim of ovulation induction is mono ovulation. Types of ovulation induction are ovulatory disorder correction, super ovulation for IUI, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation for ART. Drugs available for ovulation induction are metformin, clomiphen citrate, letrozol, HMG, FSH, recombinant FSH, and LH. So clomiphen citrate was the first line drug which increases FSH level and promotes multifollicular development. And uh, as it causes multifollicular development, it has higher uh, chances for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Pregnancy rate is lesser as compared to the ovulation rate. It has anti-estrogenic effect on endometrium, so higher chances for miscarriages. Doses uh, can be given starting from 50 milligram per day, and it can be given from day two to day five for five days. Second uh, drug is letrozol. Letrozol is um, aromatase inhibitors. It decreases estrogen level and in a uh, as, uh, and hence increases the uh, follicle uh, FSH stimulation and uh, it has less chances for OHSS as compared to CC. Starting dose can be given 2.5 milligram per day and it can be increased up to 7.5 milligram per day for five days. Extended proto protocol includes 2.5 milligram per day for 10 days and it does not increase the chances for congenital anomalies in fetus. Gonadotrophins can be second line drugs uh, which includes uh, FSH and it has uh, multiple uh, follicular stimulation. So that is also uh, for higher risk for OHSs and uh, cost is more and it can be given from seventh day and the doses depends on uh, 75 international units or 150 daily. There are step up protocols, step down protocols and sequential protocols as described by Dr. Fessel Lewis sir. Another modality is lap ovarian drilling. Uh, can be done by monopolar cautery drilling and it limits four to five hole drillings uh, can be uh, limited and proper patient selection is very important before going uh, uh, to lap ovarian drilling and uh, USG markers for ovarian reserve are AFC and ovarian volume. Now uh, we move on to the, our last session, which is the question and answer session. Uh, I request uh, speak all the three speakers, Dr. Sujata Kar, ma'am, Dr. Fessy Lewis, sir, and Ruby, madam, to answer queries that we have already received from the audience. Uh, Sneha, okay. uh, yes, Mane, sir also, Mane, sir, also can answer the questions. Yeah, He's yeah, yeah, definitely. Sir. Yes, yes. My apology, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, Mane, sir, as well. Yeah, thank you very much. And... Uh... Congratulations, uh, Dr. Sujata, Madam, Dr. Ruby, Madam, and AC sir, for a great and very excellent talks. Actually, all the all the this uh, the all the questions they have been already answered by the speakers. But uh, uh, again, we, we are receiving some questions, so uh, I'd like to uh, answer the first question. That is, the PCOD adolescent girls, in spite of counseling, they don't change their lifestyle. It's a very good question, and I think it's a very high, it has very high practical value. Because uh, in uh, our day-to-day -day OPD, what we are watching that uh, when an uh, adolescent girl comes to our OPD, we uh, almost we counsel her properly, then we give her uh, some of the other drugs, whichever is in our practice. And after passing four or six months and after accomplish, uh, com accomplishment of that uh, management, the girl again come to you after two, three months. That uh, And she will tell you that, madam, when I was on the drugs, I was uh, getting the cycles very regularly, but again, the same thing is happening. And here, what is lacking is the lifestyle management. 
basically what happened just because you and me are bombarded with the studies of the pcod and that's why we are well worth or we are aware of the importance of the lifestyle management but only by one counseling it's very difficult for that girl to get the whole knowledge and the idea regarding the importance of the lifestyle management and that's why the counseling in a very i mean very positive manner and not only the counseling of that girl but the counseling of the parent is very important what i feel the participation of that girl or the uh, the enforcement of uh, exercise and diet control only with that girl uh, and no nobody else from the family it's very difficult for example the family is enjoying some samosa and kachori and that girl is avoiding all this stuff it's not possible at all and most of the families in india at least they will never cook uh, something different for that girl only and nobody is i mean participating with her and it's very difficult for that girl to uh, force her to go to the gym or for the exercise or for the running or whatever exercise you are expecting so in my opinion the parent should be counseled properly in fact more than that girl because they are in a position to understand the complications of that pcod and the importance of the lifestyle management and they will keep watch on that girl and moreover if they are taking participation or if they are the companion of that girl not only in the exercise but even the diet control and if the whole family is uh, getting involved in both these things then and then only the lifestyle management is possible and second thing as we are following up our patients of malignancy isn't it in a very serious way in the same way we should follow we should have a follow up of these adolescent girls uh, whether they are taking the medicines properly whether they are doing the uh, lifestyle management and all and it should be a chronic process it should not be like for four months or six months and this is the crux of the story that the uh, proper counseling of the parents and involvement of the parents along with that girl in both the things the diet control and the exercise is the only remedy for changing the lifestyle of that girl i think sujata madam we would we would like to hear something from you i would like to add a point here sir yes, uh, about the adherence and the you know acceptance of that i completely agree that a family should be but the also very important is to give a short term goal if we tell her about fertility you know it's too early for the goal to understand that how what consequences can happen in future probably at this point in time her only uh, focus should be maybe improvement of her skin her hair uh, her you know fitting into her smaller cloth size you know uh, eating better feeling better being more physically active rather than you know long term uh, benefit we should talk on the short term benefit short -term that we encourage the goal exactly uh, i think that's equally important right right very right uh mahesh yes ma'am can i ask you something uh, what is the role of myonisterol and b chiro inositol in the treatment of adolescent pcos girls actually according to ishre 2018 uh, there is no any i mean drug of choice for the management of especially the adolescent uh, pcos they have recommended prosperinone uh, as uh, the this molecule but the studies of myonisterol and d chiro inositol they are going on and if you are getting the uh, i mean if you are uh, referring the guidelines then these are not the drug of choice till now uh, we can use these drugs in the adult one but not in the adolescent cases so you can use it um, empirically but there is nothing i mean uh, like guidelines uh, which says that you should use this drugs uh, for the treatment of the adolescent pcos and again i in my practice i always uh, like counsel the parents as well as that girl that 60% management is in your hand beta and only 40% what i can do and out of that 40% 20% is my counseling and 20% as the drug so if you are believing completely on the drug then it, you just forget the treatment of this pcod and unless and until you are getting yourself involved in the lifestyle management my drug won't act at all and if they are at, acting at all they will act temporarily till you are taking the drugs and that's why again in adolescent pcos probably the lifestyle management gets the higher weightage in the management thank you sir you made our concepts clear what i is a question for uh, sujata karna which anti androgen to be given in adolescent pcod prerna 
yes uh, madam was uh, had a different commitment at 8 o'clock so she probably left mane sir is there to answer and even fessy sir is there okay mane sir which anti antigen to be given fessy sir is the right person to answer this uh, anti antigen as far as possible i feel uh, uh, it must be uh, uh, it must not be given unless there is an um hyperandrogenic features just by pcos uh, in, uh, in in adolescents we must not do that what uh, i feel uh, and uh, uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, regarding one one question i saw about the de- depression part uh, uh, when you counsel the pay- adolescent uh, what happened it happened in a, in one of societies in in, in kerala they gave, gave extensively big classes about adolescents in the uh, in the schools but ultimately what happened is that lot of uh, girls got scared about whether they are having a big uh, uh, disease and uh, and that that must not be the uh, the, the way to counsel it, it has to be in such a way that it is a lifestyle disease so which can lead to these these problems like uh, infertility like uh, the um, it's to some lot of things and if you change the lifestyle it can be corrected not li- not must not be a, a given a fear factor into the adults and girls the, that's what uh, i think and uh, uh, then the chance of adult uh, patients going for depression will be less if you properly counsel the patient i saw the one question is how to tackle the depression uh, girish can you add on to that yes yes sir Uh, actually there are many uh, this uh, anti uh, i mean anti androgens which we can use in adolescent P- uh, pcos but according to again 2018 ishre they have recommended drospirinone and uh, what this is that uh, this uh, uh, ciproterone acetate uh, it can lead to dvt and that's why probably yeah, they have they recommended have drospirinone used. yeah and they are not recommending this norethisterone acetate or other progesterone because uh, probably they act on the uh, gro- i mean they uh, they act uh, adversely on the growth of that girl and that's why if the girl is below 18 years of the age then we should uh, try to avoid all other anti androgen and drospirinone is probably the dr- should be the preferred one actually there is nothing like a drug of choice but drospirinone along with the ethanol estradiol should be preferred for the management in adolescence especially uh sir uh... There, there is a question, question. what, what is, is the effect of early age ossipils on ovarian reserve what is the effect of early age ossipils on ovarian reserve uh, i think uh, it will not affect any much on, uh, on the ovarian reserve in fact uh, patient will not be ovulating uh, when we are giving so that will improve it will, affect, uh, uh, it will not affect the ovarian reserve okay sir thank you Uh, question, question for Rupi ma'am. Are there, are there any, any supplements, supplements that should be taken for those with uh, PCOD? PCOD? Actually, the microphones of both uh, the instruments, which you are, I mean, uh, side by side, probably they are work, working. No, so there is a echo. One we have to. Uh, yeah. Okay. The question regarding supplements. Supplement should not be given blindly. A complete dietary coach should be taken, and wherever we are not able to meet their dietary daily dietary recommendations as per the ICMR 2020, should only be recommended. Whether it is vitamin supplementation like vitamin D3, B12, only after biochemical uh, workup we can understand. As far as protein supplement is concerned, only when you are not able to meet the required 0.8 to 1 gram per kg body weight, we can think of giving a protein supplement. and omega 3 for supplementation also can be suggested only when we are not able to meet to the diet three if there is we are able to meet to the diet then i don't think we need to add any supplements to these young and adolescent girls it's too early to uh, unnecessarily add supplements even food can do the need thank you so much uh, ma'am can i ask you one thing what are the protocols for prescribing diet in a pcos patient so like uh, there is no standard format it has to be case to case it has to be customized you can't have a printed diet sheet for everybody one size does not fit all what is our lifestyle diet is a part of lifestyle modification it has to be uh, as per the patient we only need to focus broadly on the limited intake of carbohydrates increasing the protein and the fiber and giving a good quality fatty acids to the girl we keeping this accordingly the diet plan has to be made as per her lifestyle as per her choices as per the family structure 
so it's going to be the family not only her for and she's a young girl let's just remember this she's a young girl she also has you know friends and others around her she can't be always in isolation she's a part of the family and society there is no one pcod diet which she has to follow yeah. thank you ma'am Uh, Ma'am, nowadays there is an increasing trend for keto diet. Is it advised for uh, obese PCOD? Is it safe? Well, the original use of keto diet is in epilepsy, where you need a real high fat diet. Otherwise, keto diet for weight loss has been very temporary. Back as long as you and also especially when these girls are insulin resistant, their body fat percentage is very high. Uh, I've seen a lot of patients who do keto diet for a very rapid weight loss. and they increase the body fat percentage in the body weight after two or three months as they leave the diet and it's a very impractical diet so it's a complete no no for the young girls to take up anything which is a fat diet a complete balanced meal with five food groups as i mentioned is the best diet for any girl to stay away from the junk and the edible junk i would say that should be enough to bring her back uh, and i think there's one more question about which protein base now i don't understand what the uh, meaning of the protein base but protein so class 1 protein is basically the animal protein and even milk is an animal protein to be very specific so anything with milk and milk products lean meat eggs fish a class 1 protein which is the best protein but class 2 protein means those who are vegetarians can still take soya which is best among them so soya nuts and pulses give the protein for those who are vegetarian including the dairy product now uh, even ma'am what i meant was which protein powder do you recommend i mean whether plant based or animal based because there is a that there is a big fad in these uh, girls especially to use protein powder and go to gym so protein powder is on a great demand these days so if you are not able to meet the protein requirement through the diet then among the protein supplement the whey protein is the highest biological value if the patient is lactose intolerant then you can go for soya based protein there are plant protein which is soya and pea protein based that should be considered only when you are lactose intolerant because there is a myth that milk and milk products are not suitable for those who are uh, having pcos but this way is a, the first class protein which is ideal and best choice for those who are taking protein supplements thank, thank you so, you so much ma'am Uh, sir, I would like to ask a uh, point about yeah. especially these girls who pick up the protein supplement. They should also make sure that they are taking protein supplement which are uh, free of creatine. There are a lot of people who are into weight training, heavy weight training, body building kind of thing. So they have protein supplement which is whey plus branched amino acids plus creatine. They must avoid that. It should be only hundred percent whey, nothing else. Okay, ma'am. Uh, sir, I would like to ask, what is the treatment for metropathia hemorrhagica in adolescent heavy prolonged and irregular menstrual cycles? Metropathia hemorrhagica, you mean? Can you repeat the cycles? No, no. Can you repeat the whole question, please? So, what is the treatment for metropathia hemorrhagica mm -hmm. in adolescent heavy prolonged periods and irregular cycles? Actually, nowadays we are not using. So terminology, not only in the adults but in the uh, even in the adolescent. So we can, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we can put the. Sir, की आवाज आ रही है? Sir, we cannot hear you. My mic is on. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, what i am uh, trying to say you that nowadays we are not using these terminologies that is metropathia hemorrhagica or uh, 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 then uh, the same things uh, so okay. the, the common terminologies not only in the uh, in the adults but even the uh, in the adolescent is heavy menstrual bleeding now uh, it depends the management depends upon the etiology of the heavy menstrual bleeding for example if the girl is having the same history uh, from the from beginning of her menstrual career that is from her uh, menarche then there is a possibility of blood dyscrasia i mean she can have wilt blot disease or some some kind like that then in such cases you will have to diagnose it and you must treat such kind of patients along with the hematologist and you should never take the patients alone on your own responsibility uh, responsibility then if uh, 
then you should look for any anatomical problems with that girl for example you uh, didelphus uterus or even the possibility of fibroid uh, even though it is rare but can be there then some ovarian pathologies can be there then you uh, you need to treat in that way and if at all the patient is having everything normal i mean there is no anatomical problem she is not having like uh, any uh, this blood dyscrasia and all then probably using the only progesterone that is uh, this uh, drospirinone p uh, dronis p the, the liver management is there so we can use uh, these drugs and we can manage and uh, uh, if the patient is having very acute bleeding then the management of the acute bleeding is very needed you can do uh, this with the tranexamic acid and whatever you know whatever way you want and then you should take care of her anemia if at all she is suffering from then uh, you sh should go for proper laboratory investigations and if at all you should go for ultrasonography and you have to treat the acute part then the chronic treatment you have to plan for and if at all your patient is anemic then you have to take uh, care of her uh, hemoglobin status it should be about 12 yes sir understood thank you sir thank you for enlightening the topic uh, i think uh, most of the queries are solved and the topics and today's talks are clear to all of us yeah uh, well, it was in the... i want to appreciate and uh, really appreciate and congratulate for very first time uh, after attending so many webinars i am i am i'm seeing one thing that prerna and sneha have uh, i mean given the take home messages i mean they have noted down everything from all the three speakers and they have elaborated i mean it's a revision kind of thing really it is applicable congratulations and uh, thank you sneha and prerna for uh, your take home messages thank you very much uh, uh, mane sir you, one sir. more uh, one more question to you Prerna. sir uh, actually there are many girls who come with heavy bleeding like yeah. soaking more than three pads per day with clots and pay, girls are really pale so apart from tranexamic acid what hormonal treatment do you prefer madam in such cases uh, actually we should give little bit heavy uh, this uh, hormone i mean uh, the whatever uh, 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 for example norethisterone acetate or medroxyprogesterone acetate whatever you are using it should be given thrice a day means eight hourly till the bleeding stops then you have to reduce it uh, for once uh, uh, sorry twice a day and then you can shift it on the once a day for uh, I mean, the whole management should be for 21 days and actually practically it is said theoretically it is said that we can give the injection injection of estrogen also but uh, unfortunately they are not available in india so in my opinion the heavy doses of progesterone along with the tranexamic acid till the blood stop and then reduce it slowly gradually and the management should be given for 21 to 25 days uh, sir this is for first cycle then do you uh, keep them on maintenance of any but uh, most of the or... patients most of the patients they get uh, such kind of troubles in the first cycle only and if at all the patient is getting the same thing you can repeat it again no issue okay. what, what i do girish is that in those patients uh, uh, give uh, two cycle of uh, ocp after that Uh, so that uh, after that uh, it will be cycles will be little more regular correct actually ocpil reduces the uh, the uh, this um, androgenic part of this uh, i mean hormone and they increases the shbg that is uh, that's why they act uh, efficiently than only progesterone uh, if we are uh, considering the patients with heavy menstrual bleeding what sir said is practically very i mean uh, good thing sir but uh, are oc's recommended in 12 12 13 year old year old girls no no so, not at all i mean it is not the issue of recommendation but when the patient is coming to you with heavy menstrual bleeding with the i mean that kind of status no she is becoming pale so in such cases to give these uh, drugs for two or three months may not be causing any problem because okay. to lose the hemoglobin is rather uh, i no, mean risk. dangerous for that girl rather than to use the ocfil for two or three months isn't it yeah very true uh sneha prerna are yes. we over with the questions yes yes uh it was indeed a very good academic feast hope every one of you have enjoyed it i would like to thank dr girish mane sir for taking time from your busy schedule to be guest of honor at our webinar your presence and wise words help magnify the cost in the best possible way i pay my deepest gratitude and special thanks to all our three eminent speakers dr sujata kar ma'am dr fasil louis sir and ruby madam for making this complicated topic easy for us and expanding our knowledge for the same 
I would also like to thank our president, Dr. Rupali Madam, and Akola Obijava Society for this wonderful webinar. I would like to thank our audience for their presence and patient hearing. Last but not the least, I would like to thank Corona Remedies for providing us with this virtual platform. Now I request our president, Madam, Dr. Rupali Rathi, ma'am, to say a few words. Thank you, Sneha. Uh, I sincerely thank all the speakers. I sincerely thank Dr. Girish Mane, sir. sir. You were so busy today, actually. Even then, you took out time and uh, you came. Uh, I mean, you were present for this webinar and uh, many of your suggestions and your uh, advices were helpful. Uh, thank you, Ruby, ma'am. You have differently uh, uh, like highlighted the diet part of PCOS. Actually, the treatment starts from diet which is very less discussed, especially in a gynecologist clinic. So I really thank you for your uh, lecture. I sincerely thank Sujata Kar, ma'am. She was busy with some other commitment. Even then, she was she agreed to come at 6 o'clock and deliver her lecture. I thank you all of them. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Prerna. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, all. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hope this could uh, really help a lot of uh, doctors. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Madam, uh, Rupali, madam, uh, yeah. webinar like, you, know, you just put one mail to uh, ICOG people. They grant some uh, ICOG points for every webinar. Okay. That Actually, sir, good. this was uh, uh, planned in a very short period of time. Even, right? if you are, even if you are giving them uh, or sending them mail one day, night, I mean one night before, now, they will grant you one mark. So probably the okay. uh, we can we can have more viewers for this program. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'll definitely do that for next time. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.